thank you for coming to a live rocker group performance. Uh, First story is the weaver and the herdsman. It is the story of the weaver, Orihime, who used to sit on the Amonogawa, which is a Japanese term for the Milky Way, up in the heavens. <clears throat> she sat by the river all day long and weaved celestial fabric, fabric that all of the deities wore. She just sat by the riverside and she would weave this fabric. And her father, the Sky King would watch her from afar, and he noticed that she seemed sad, very melancholy. So one day he approached, and he said, My daughter, why do you seem so sad? And poor Orihime said, Father, all I do is sit and weave the celestial fabric. I'm so lonely, and you're nothing to talk to personally. <laughs> and the Sky King thought, well, you're of that right age. Perhaps you should get married. Or he may said, but father, who would I marry? I just sit here by the river and make clothes all day. Ugh. He said, what about the herdsman on the other side of the river? Hikoboshi. He's a nice young fellow. He's got a fine herd, hard worker. She said, well, perhaps. Could you arrange a meeting for me? So the Sky King arranged a meeting at a bridge built across the Amonogawa. And there, Orihime and Hikoboshi met for the first time. And Hikoboshi brought his entire herd. And he had cows of all types and heifers, and including one one-horned cow who always said, who? <laughs> he was very confused. <clears throat> Upon their first meeting, they fell immediately in love. They were wed, everyone was happy, and Orihime and Hikoboshi spent all their time together. They enjoyed each other's company immensely. And as time went on, the Sky King started to realize that his supply of celestial fabric was diminishing and diminishing because Orihime was spending all of her time with her new husband. And this made him very upset. So he approached Orihime and he said, My daughter, why are you not working any longer? And she said, You're married to this guy, you wouldn't be doing anything about him either. <laughs> so the Sky King got angry. He's, he said, Well then, you don't get to see him any longer took her back to his side of the river, and he destroyed the bridge, and he forced her to go back to work. However, now she was even more sad than she was before. Now, instead of weaving the celestial fabric, she just cried into it, which really destroyed the fabric. <laughs> so finally, after weeks of this, Sky King comes to his daughter, and he sees how badly he has hurt her. He says, my daughter, what is wrong? What can I do to help? And she said, well, first you set me up with a guy and then you take me away from him. <laughs> I would love to see my dearest Hikoboshi again. The Sky King said, well, perhaps we can make a deal. If you work hard and make twice as much celestial fabric as you used to, then one day a year you can meet him. On the seventh day of the seventh month, I will let you meet him. And Urahime said, that's pretty specific, but hey, one day's better than nothing. Maybe I can work out from there. <clears throat> so she went to work immediately, and she just made the fabric away until she was able to clothe all of heaven. And then the seventh day of the seventh month came, and she approached her father and said, Father, guess what day it is? And he said, mm -hmm, what? <clears throat> she said, it's the seventh day of the seventh month. It's time for me to go meet Hikoboshi. And the Sky King said, very well. You've done well on your part of the deal. You may go and see Hikoboshi. So Orihime immediately went to the Amanagawa. And there she found the bridge was still broken. There was no way for her to cross over to Hikoboshi's side. Hikoboshi on his side of the river could see her, but there was no way he could get over to her. And he looked at his herd and he said, what should I do? And all that he got back was, mm. <laughs> <clears throat> So Hikoboshi stood on his side of the river, helpless. And Orihime collapsed to her knees. And she began to weep. 
and a flock of magpies on the earth heard her weeping, and they felt that it was so sad. So they ascended to the heavens and created a bridge, and from there, Orihime and Hikoboshi were able to meet on that fateful day, and it was joyous again. Once the day was over, they went their separate ways, and the magpies returned to the earth. And for the next year, Orihime went to work, working for her father, the Sky King, in the hopes and knowledge that on the next seventh day of the next seventh month, she would again get to see her beloved husband, Hikoboshi. <clears throat> and that is the story of Tanabata, which is the Japanese Valentine's Day. Now, they say whenever it rains on Tanabata Day, it's because the magpies were busy and they weren't able to ascend to the heavens to create a bridge for Ihime. And the rain is her tears. And the moral of the story is, never trust a magpie, they're lazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, dance for us. <clears throat> All right, what you've just witnessed, yeah, because anybody can hear me. What you've just witnessed is a rakugo. A rakugo is the Japanese art of sit-down comedy. <clears throat> uh, it began in the Edo period, uh, and at that time it was called, uh, more flowery terms, literally, hanashi, because rakugo is a term for uh, it means falling leaves or falling flowers. A practitioner of Rakugo is a Rakugo Ka, which simply means Rakugo uh, practitioner. They used to be called a Hanashi Ka because that's what it was called inside. <clears throat> uh, ideally, it comes upon the, the artist steps on the stage, sits down on the koza, the sitting pillow, and the performance takes place the entire time that, that person is sitting. When they stand up, that's the end of the show. Now, the Tanabata story was actually a fairly short rakugo. Uh, rakugo often go on for a half hour or more. Uh, <clears throat> it uh, utilizes two props, as you noticed, the tenugui, the cloth. It also has several other names, but that's the most common is the tenugui, the cloth, or the handkerchief. And the other is the sensu, the flan, the fan. That'd be delicious. <laughs> uh, the fan, usually a paper folding fan, but those are five bucks. This was a dollar at the dollar store. <clears throat> you start the story off with a makara, which means pillow. Now, <clears throat> it sounds great, but a makara used to be either made out of wood or out of ceramic, and you would put it under your head back in those days uh, because the Japanese didn't know what a pillow was, apparently. Uh, but now the pillows have actually developed, the word makara has just fit with it. But the first part is called a makara because it sets up the fall into the story as you fall into bed and place your head upon the pillow. <clears throat> uh, didn't do quite a proper makara, but I will in the next one just so that you know what it is and you'll see it when it comes. Uh, the main story is the hondai, and that was the Tanabata story. Uh, punchline at the end, the oshi, and that was the magpie crack, that is the punchline in the end. The idea of a rakugo is this very long-winded, multi-character story portrayed by one person who does either a mannerism or moves their head, changes their voice a little bit to signify a change in character. Uh, and like I said, some of these go on for a half an hour, and ultimately it's a one-liner at the end, and that's the oshi, the punchline. Now, there's little bits of jokes in there all through it. Kusuguri. And those are your mid-story jokes and puns. Perfect Rakugo is filled with all kinds of puns and wordplay. <clears throat> uh, but those are your three stages. Uh, your Makura, your Hondai, and your Oshi, with your uh, Kusuguri mixed into the middle. So now that we've had a good love story, let's have a good action story.
<clears throat> For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Richard Schaefer. Uh, on the website dickjutsu.com. Sounds dirty, but it isn't. <clears throat> my grandfather's name was Richard, but he went by Dick. So I was named after him. Uh, jutsu is a Japanese word for technique or style. My website, Dick Jutsu, is Richard's Technique or Richard's Style. Uh, I also run Samurai Guy Den on YouTube, which targets a uh, web series about Japanese history. <clears throat> uh, this is my first ever live Rock and Go performance. Uh, if you couldn't tell by how rough around the edges it is. Uh, and you're my first audience, so give yourselves a hand. And trust me, you deserve it more than I do. <clears throat> so, like I said, the first story was the story of Tanabata. Touching love story, a little bit of a sad ending. Our second story is the story of Shaohu Dunzai. Shaohu Dun was a warrior and general in the third century of China, during the Three Kingdoms period, which came at the very tail end of the Han Dynasty. Uh, in Japan, he is known as Kakuto. Uh, we'll be referring to him by his original Chinese, which is kind of weird because this is a Japanese storytelling thing, but uh, Shahu Dun served his cousin, Cao Cao. Uh, Cao Cao was originally of the Shahu family, but was adopted by the venerable Cao family. <clears throat> uh, yes. Shahu Dun was his cousin. He was trained in the uh, Spear and the club, good warrior, good general. Now, eventually, Cao Cao founds the Kingdom of Wei, the northernmost kingdom during the Three Kingdoms period, and the strongest. But long before this, he was just a small landowner in the Central Plains. He was controlling the emperor, eventually. Uh, but at this point, He's still on his rise up, and Shao Hudan is one of his main generals. <clears throat> so, he is at war, and he's been attacked from behind too many times by the most powerful warrior in the land, Lu Bu. Ooh, do not pursue Lu Bu. He's finally saying, enough is enough, I'm going to attack Lu Bu, and I'm going to put an end to it. So he sends 50,000 troops, horse and foot, which is a fancy way of saying he had cavalry and infantry. Shao Dun was the vanguard commander. <clears throat> they march into the plains of Yan province. <clears throat> and the division of Cao Cao's army under Shao Dun, having marched out in advance, came first upon one of Lu Bu, ooh, do not pursue Lu Bu, one of Lu Bu's generals, Gao Shun. Shao Dun at once rode out with a spear set and said, you there! Are you Lu Bu? Gao Shun said, no. I am merely Gao Shun. Shao Shun said, well then you'll have to do. I'm going to fight you personally. Because why bring 50,000 men? I'll just do it myself. <laughs> and Gao Shun said, well, I think you're an idiot, so I'll agree to that. And they rode at each other, engaged in fierce fighting. They fought half a hundred battles, which is a fancy way of saying 50. And after that, Gao Shun drew back and he said, Whew, I am feeling quite fatigued. What do you say we take a break, grab a drink, and come back in an hour, and then finish killing each other? Because that was something they did back then. And Shao Dun said, Tired? I'm not tired at all. I'll just kill you now. And Gao Shun, being the smart man, said, Well, I'm going to run away. So he turned his steed. And he galloped as hard as he could. And Shao Dun said, Excuse me, sir. You did say you're not Lu Bu, right? And Gao Shun said, No, I'm just Gao Shun. And Shao Dun said, hmm. Then I think I'll pursue. Because, ooh, never pursue Lu Bu. So Shao Dun kicks up his steed. And he rides as hard at Gao Shun as he can. Just as he's closing on him, He's gone through Gao Shun's ranks. They spread to the side because this guy is crazy. <clears throat> One of Gao Shun's cohorts at Cao Xing, no relation to Cao Cao, he pulls out his bow, strings it, knocks an arrow onto it, and waits for the opportune moment. And 
just as Shahudun comes through a break in the ranks, he lets fly the arrow. Whew. All right, he was further away than I thought he was. <laughs> Shahudun never sees it coming, and it strikes him in the left eye, and he says heroically, <laughs> so he grabs the arrow, he pulls the arrow out, and with it comes his eye. So now, bleeding profusely from the eye, he looks at his eye upon the arrow, and he says heroically, Ow! And he raises it to the sky, and he says, <laughs> he says, essence of my father, blood of my mother, I cannot throw this gift away. And he plunges it into his mouth, bites it off, and swallows it whole. And then he says, hmm, that's not that bad. Would've worked better than a dumpling, maybe. Now, still bleeding from the eye, he says, well, I don't care about Gao Shun anymore. You there, Cao Xing. Oh. And Cao Xing bravely said, oh, crap. <laughs> Cao Xing ran. <clears throat> Xiao Hudun, still bleeding from the eye, kicked up his steed. And he rode at him hoisted up his spear, and stabbed at him. Hmm. I seem to be lacking in depth perception. I'll have to get this checked out later. He stabbed at him, struck him in the chest, drove him to the ground, and he killed Cao Xing. And then he looked at the 50,000 men of Lu Bu's side. Ooh, I'll pursue Lu Bu. And he said, well, now I'm fatigued. I think I'll turn around and go back where I came from. But, bleeding profusely from the eye, everybody looked at him and said, I'm not messing with this guy. And he kicked up steed once more, rode back to his own lines, and survived. <clears throat> In the end, Lu Bu, ooh, not pursue Lu Bu, was defeated. Xiao Xing, did not see that coming. <laughs> All right, so you could see there a more fuller makara. That was the introduction, uh, you know, giving my website and all that. The Makara was used, one, to introduce new, you know, not really accustomed people who didn't have their name out there. It was a good way to introduce them, who I am. Uh, you would often state who your teacher was, if you had a prominent teacher that people would have heard of. Uh, you could also tell them future shows you're going to do. Oh, you know, this is my first time in the studio, or, you know, this theater, but I'll be here all week, and blah, 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 blah. It was a good way for marketing. It gets people ready for the show. <clears throat> I also told you about Shao Hu Dun. For anybody who wouldn't be aware of the story, you can give a few lead-ins of what's going on so that when the story starts, everybody's on the same page as you. I'm probably ahead of schedule, aren't I? It is 11.25. Oh, I'm not too bad. <clears throat> uh, the story of Shao Hu Dun, like I said, I told you, it was a third uh, century Chinese warrior. So you all knew our setting, our place, and our characters. And that's all part of the Makara. And then I got into the story. The Hondai was the story of the battle and the duel with Gao Shun and Zhao Zeng shooting him in the eye. Uh, the Oshi, of course, was Zhao Zeng didn't see it coming. Uh, the uh, Kusuguri were the little things like, ooh, do not pursue Lu Bu. Those little you know, puns and tricks, uh, you could call that a live meme. <clears throat> ah, like I said, everything ends with a punchline. Honda is the whole story. Kusuguri is the, the little. Uh, Kusuguri means uh, midway punches. Uh, more of a translator. Uh, that's what it is. It's that little jab in there to make you giggle in the middle of the story. <clears throat> uh, uh, a good example of another Rakugo that I've seen performed. Uh, the guy's Makura is, now this is a Japanese Rakugo artist performing in America, but performing a traditionally Japanese story. So his makara starts with explaining a few Japanese terms, where he mentions a jinrikisha, uh, because the average you know, English audience wouldn't understand what that is. 
She explains that Jin Risha is the old form of a taxi. Back in, you know, the old days, Edo period Japan, it was a guy with a cart and he would pull the cart around. And he said, you know, horses, only the wealthiest and the samurai could afford them, so this was the commoner's way of getting around. <clears throat> And he tells the story of a businessman, you know, a merchant who is late, and he's got to be somewhere quickly. So he goes out and he tries to find, you know, a jinrikisha, uh, jinrikisha driver who can take him there. And he finds this guy just kind of lounging, uh, you know, smoking a pipe. And he approaches him and says, I need to get somewhere. And the guy's like, ugh, oh, I'm the fastest jinrikisha driver in all the land. So he's like, great, I've got to be somewhere quick. So he gets on this guy's uh, cart. And the guy takes him, you know, and he's just rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling and getting faster and faster and faster. And in the end, he gets so fast that the guy, ah, oh, faints from the speed. And when he wakes up, they're in a place of all white. They've had a huge accident and crashed and died, and now he's in heaven. And that's the punchline, is that they've died, and ha 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 ha. It is a 30 minute long story. <laughs> uh, one of the shortest outlines, because the idea of a Rakugo is it's not a fully written out story. You're given a broad outline, and then your style is how you tell the story, what kusuguri you use, how you emphasize the punchline, how you do the characters and everything. <clears throat> uh, in that, you saw that Gao Shun, I uh, raised the pitch of my voice and made him seem a little more. Oh. Or Shahu Dan, I projected a little more. Uh, one of the shortest Rakugo outlines is about a bathtub. <clears throat> They're in a spa, guy's in a bathtub, and he dies. So the owner is, oh, you know, the spa, calls in a doctor. And the doctor comes in, and he checks the guy out, and he says, okay, this is what we need to do. Drain the tub. So you make a big thing about, oh, they drain the tub, and you can do, uh, have two props. So you can do things like, you know, oh, oh, this is a bucket now. Oh, well, you're trying to get out of the tub. You can make this be the tub and you know, oh, oh. or you could make this be the bucket. And that's how you're doing it. <clears throat> and in the end, the punchline is he go, you know, once they get all the water out of the tub, however you do it, you do it multiple ways, and, oh, everything's funny. <clears throat> in the end, then the punchline is, you know, now what do we do? All right. Put a lid on it, nail it shut. And the joke, of course, is that a Japanese bathtub looks very similar to an old school Japanese coffin. All around. So he's dead. Pop a lid on it, go bury him. <clears throat> but once again, it's three lines of outline to do a 20 to 30 minute story. <clears throat> uh, stop, Jake. 11.29. Uh, as I said, your two props, these are the only two lines you've got to feed yourself with. But you can do innumerable things with them. As I should, I just sat on my mouse. Uh, Face the mic towards you. Hmm? Face the mic towards you. That would probably help. <laughs> so, as you saw, in the uh, uh, Tanabata story, for the Sky King, I did this. It's like a, you know, uh, my god, or a crown on a helmet or something. Makes him look regal. Set up taller. Uh, Orihime is portrayed as a demure woman in the story. So I went like this and oh. <clears throat> uh, the, <laughs> the one horned cow. <laughs> Which would be part of my style. No other story has that. Mm. Uh, have for Shahu Dun, the bleeding eye. Oh. Uh, uh, other examples I've seen with these, uh, uh, I mentioned the generic Shah driver, the, the guy that was doing it, had him sitting there and he's just smoking his kisuru, uh, kiseru, his pipe. And another guy comes up, he's like, oh. makes a show out of it. And, How can I help you? Uh, for the cart. He holds it like this, tucks it under his arm because he's running with the cart. <clears throat> uh, uh, other stories, uh, uh, seen it used, surprisingly enough, as a fan. 
Uh, I just in my story there, you saw it as an arrow. Uh, another alternative, if you were doing the Shakudan story, you could. Wrap it around, oh, you know, bandage his eye, he's wearing a patch. <clears throat> so those are your only two props. It's all a matter of imagination from that point. And you've got to feed into the audience's imagination. You've got a fishing line, perhaps. Whatever you've got. Uh, your props help to feed into your kusaguri as well. Whoops, that was wrong. That was not a kusaguri, that is merely incompetence. story for you will be Boltandoro. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to the final story of Live Rakugo. This year's theme for Teco 2017 is horror, the supernatural. And one of the highlights on a lot of the art was the story of Boltandoro. The Peony Lantern. Now, the story of Botandoro has multiple different storytelling ways. Uh, there is a Rakugo version, there's also a Bunraku version, and they'd use puppets. <clears throat> uh, they've done a Kabuki version up on stage. Uh, it is too new of a story to really have a no drama, uh, which is a much older style of theater. <clears throat> but in various times, when each of these things were in vogue, each of the stories were more popular tellings of Botan Dor. Uh, clearly, judging by what you're here, this is going to be the Rakugo telling. It would be a really weird panel if I just suddenly pulled out puppets. <laughs> uh, story of Botan Doro, it goes back, you know, ages. But we're going to concentrate on the Edo period form. There are, as I said, different forms of it, and uh, different ways of telling it. <clears throat> Botondoro, as I said, is the peony lantern, and it's the story of young Saburo and his new love, Otsuyu. <coughs> Saburo is a young samurai. His parents died when he was young, and he's inherited, I should put sorry. He's inherited his, fam you know, his familial estates. He's wealthy, but he's alone. He decides to go out to a festival. And while there, he's really not having fun. His servants have really tried to force him out there because he's just so lonely and really doesn't enjoy anything in life anymore. He plays the fishing game. It's just not fun. It doesn't intrigue him. Uh, he, <clears throat> he watches the theater and the puppets. And mm, it's not a bad story, but he just can't get into it. He wishes there was somebody there with him to enjoy it with. And then he meets a young lady with her maid. The young lady is Otsuyu. And the young lady's maid carries a, a peony lantern. It's a, a simple lantern made of paper, but with a symbol of a peony on it. So that as she walks, it displays a flower-shaped shadow everywhere that she goes. And he thinks this is intriguing. He says, oh. Not only is she beautiful, wealthy enough to have a maid that follows her around, but that's a great, you know, lamp. Uh, I must go speak to her. So he approaches and he introduces himself. I am Sabu. I was intrigued by your lantern and just intrigued by the way you carry yourself, which was a fancy way of saying, you know, that's but. <laughs> Otsuyu introduces herself. I am Otsuyu of the such and such family. <clears throat> you know, I live over here. My father is this, and my mother is that. Da, 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 da. And they exchange lineages so that they know that they're both aristocratic. Because you can't marry commoners back in his day. <laughs> so they get to talking, and they have so many interests. And they get to going about the festival. And they do. Saburo does all the things he had already done. He does the fishing game again. It's just more fun with her. 
They watch the puppets and they both laugh. Oh, the puppets are adorable. Some of them are a little creepy, but they're great. The story is great. And oh, when something funny happens, he leans, he's like, oh, and they're both laughing together. And they just have a great time. The festival is over. And they go back home. And Saburo, all they can think about is this beautiful young woman, Otsu. The next day, he writes her a poem. He gets the finest paper he can find, the best brush, and he grinds up the ink, and he writes the best poem he can come up with. And he looks at it, says, this will have to do. It's not worthy of her, but it will have to do. He folds it up, and he sends it to a messenger. The messenger takes it to Otsu's house. She reads it, and she immediately falls in love. His words are just so touching. And she writes one back. And they decide they must meet immediately. So, they meet. Otsuyu goes over to Saburo's home. And as young people are wont to do, it progresses a bit. <clears throat> so, they boink. And it's enjoyable, they love it. It just makes them fall deeper in love. But Otsuyu must go home at the end of the night. Now, Otsuyu's aunt doesn't like Saburo. She doesn't think he's a good guy. Not just because he's boinking her niece. <clears throat> she doesn't like that whole family. They're all a bunch of miscreants. So she forbids Otsuyu from seeing Saburo. But Otsuyu says too bad. She's fallen in love with Saburo, and Saburo has fallen in love with her. And so Otsuyu sneaks out at night and goes to Saburo's home. And they just laugh, and they talk, and they boink, and they just enjoy time with each other. But before sundown, Otsuyu has to get back home before her aunt finds out. And this proceeds for days, weeks, months. They enjoy every moment of time. And every time Otsuyu comes, her maid is with her, carrying the peony lantern to light their way, because they're going by cover of darkness. <clears throat> so one day, Saburo is there. He's waiting for her to show up. But she doesn't come. Perhaps something have got in her way. Perhaps something is waylaying her. Maybe there's construction. <clears throat> so he waits, and he waits, and daylight comes. But she never showed up. So he says, well, perhaps something caught her up and she wasn't able to come to me. I wait until tomorrow. And the next day comes. The sun rises, the sun falls, and now it's night, and he waits. But she doesn't come. And he waits, and he waits, and he waits. But she never comes that day. She decides, perhaps there's something that I did wrong, and I've upset her. I'll write her another poem. So once again, he gets his best paper, grinds up his ink, and he writes her a poem. He sends the poem to her by messenger. But he doesn't get a reply this time. And he thinks, ugh, I really screwed up this time. So I write her another poem. He sends that to her. And the messenger comes back and says, no reply. So he writes a smaller poem. Puts it on to a pigeon. And sends the pigeon her way. The pigeon doesn't return with the message. So he tries everything he can. He sends, tries to send smoke signals. But all he does is burn down one of his storehouses. And he decides, well, won't be trying that one again. <laughs> he sends messengers on foot. He sends messengers on horse. The horse messenger ran the foot messenger over. And he says, I have to coordinate that better next time. <laughs> this goes on for days and weeks and months. But he never gets a response. Finally, one day, Otsuyu's aunt shows up. And she says, Cut it out! I mean, yeah, I never have to buy kindling again because I got paper all over the place. She's dead. She fell ill and died. Months ago. Cut it out. Saburu is beside himself. All he does all day now is cry. He just sits at home and he weeps. And this goes on for days and weeks and months. And his servants say, 
Ugh, this is depressing. Now they're worse off than they began. Not only is he lackadaisical lazy because he's lonely, but now all he does is cry all day. So another festival comes, and they convince him, just go to the festival. Maybe it'll break your spirits. Maybe you'll be able to forget about it. He says, oh, I'll never forget about it. Such a great lantern. <laughs> but he goes. He relents. He goes to the festival. Plays the fishing game. But it's not the same without her. He watches the puppets, and the one has a peony crest on its clothes, and it reminds him of her. And he goes to the festival, and he just has no purpose. Then he sees on a wall. Was that the shadow of a peony? He goes around the corner, and there's nothing there. He must have just seen something. But as he turns on the other corner, there's a peony shadow. Or was there? So he goes, and he continues through this festival until he gets to the edge of it. And there he sees Otsuyu. And she's dead. And her maid with the peony lantern. So he approaches, and he says, why haven't you written me back? Your aunt told me that you died. And Otsuyu said, my aunt hates you. She lied to you. I've been fine, but she's forbidden me from seeing you. I had to sneak out, and I've had to find all new ways of sneaking. But every time I wrote back to you, she caught my messengers. She shot down my pigeons. She's a fantastic archer. <clears throat> I tried to send smoke signals, but I burnt down my storehouse. <laughs> and he goes, ha! Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> so they bond again, and under the cover of a peony lantern shadow, they leave the festival, and they bonk, of course, it's been months. <clears throat> so now, they've reconnoitered, they've reconnected, in other words, to start with the <laughs> Motsuyu has found a new way to sneak out, and Saburo says very well, I will Patiently, and by patiently I mean not very patiently at all, please come tomorrow. I will patiently await you. And the next night, he awaits, watching out in the darkness. And there over the hill, he sees a light, a peony lantern. And also you comes. And they just enjoy their time together. He's missed her so much. And they bonk. <clears throat> and the next night, once again, she's back. The peony lantern guiding the way. And Saburo is so happy. His servants are happy. Oh, good. We're not going to go bankrupt anymore. He's going back to work. During the day, he works hard. He's happy. And at night, I don't know what's changed, but he's happy again. He hasn't mentioned anything to us, but hey. So one night, a servant hears some noises coming from his bedroom. And as bonking as want to do. And he goes to investigate. And he slides open the door screen a little bit. And there he sees Saburo in the clutches of a skeletal woman. And he says, Maybe I'm just too drunk. I, I didn't see that. So he goes back to his work. And the next night, he goes to check it again. And once again, Saburo's there in the clutches of a skeletal woman. <clears throat> so the servant decides, I'm going to need a priest for this. And he goes to the Buddhist temple nearby, and he tells the priest what he saw. And the priest says, oh, this is very strange. So the priest goes to Saburo, and he explains what's happened. And he says, your servant says that he found you in the clutches of a woman. Saburo says, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the priest says, well, he says that this woman was very skeletal and corpse-like. Saburo says, no, oh, no, she's thick. <laughs> Saburo likes the thick ladies. <clears throat> and the priest says, mm, I know you were hanging out with that Otsuyu girl for a long time. 
It wouldn't by any chance be her, would it? Sopper said, oh, you betcha, son. I mean, you follow. <laughs> and the priest says, come with me. Let me show you something. So the priest takes Sabro to the temple, and he shows him a gravestone with Otsuyu's name on it. He says, Otsuyu's aunt was alive. She's dead. You've been visited by a spirit. He said, you're looking a little uh, frail lately, aren't you? And Sabra was thinking, oh, I have been feeling a little fatigued. It's harder to work in the day, but, but I'm happy. So it's just overexerting myself. Perhaps during the night. And the priest tells him, oh, I think she's sucking the life out of you, my boy. Let me put up wards to protect your life. Sabra was... Well, I can't really argue with the evidence. There's her grave there. And she did feel a little cold. So the priest puts up Hanafuda. He puts up cards. And he puts up all kinds of wounds. Paper fans, paper everything. He puts guards on it. And he has monks chanting all night long. And that night, Sabra sits there, contemplating what he's done. And then over the crest of the hill, he sees the light of a peony lantern. And Otsuyu calls out to him and says, My dearest Sabra, I can't come near. And Sabra realizes it's because of the wards. That confirms it. She is dead. So the next night, Otsuyu comes back, and she calls to him all night. I love you, Saburo. Please, let me in. And Saburo just crouches in his bedroom and weeps. He stopped working for the day. He's more lonely before than he was when he first found out that she died. Because now, she's just right there. But I can't be with her. And he begins to waste away. He forgets to eat. He forgets to work. He forgets to sleep. He just forgets. And one of his servants realizes, if he dies, I don't have a job. So the servant quietly goes out one night, and he just tears down one of the wards. Just one. And that night, Sabra watches as the peony lantern comes to the gates and enters. Oh, maybe she's not dead. She's alive after all. She was just too scared with the guards and the wards and all that. And Otsu, under the cover of the light of her maid's peony lantern, comes in. And her and Sabra spend the night together. And they are in love once again, upon meeting each other. They rekindle their love. And that night, they spend the night together. And Otsuyu says, I don't want to leave in the morning. Sabra says, you don't have to. And so they spend the night together. And that morning, the servant comes in, and he slides open the door. And there is Sabra, clutched in the arms of a skeleton. And he is dead. But he has one heck of a grin on his face. <laughs> Where are we for time? You have ten minutes. Mm. Time is perfect. All right, everyone. That was uh, Rock Who Go. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the stories. Uh, it's definitely something to look into if you're into it. Uh, if you're not familiar, there is actually an anime uh, right now. It's just been renewed for a second season. It hasn't gotten uh, really an English dub release. They do have subs on Crunchyroll and such <coughs> uh, called Showa and Roku Rakugo Shinju. Uh, yeah, 
Second season just finished? Yeah. I haven't started yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, the second season is Falling Leaves. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, what I've gotten enough time to watch looks pretty good. Uh, but that's Rakugo. The whole story is about Rakugo if you haven't seen it. Uh, as I said, as far as I've seen, it's seen uh, far, as far as I've watched it, it seems pretty good. I suggest it. Uh, it is, yes. Uh, but that's Rakugo. What's that? It was the best show last year. Oh, good. Definitely have to finish it. Uh, like I said, uh, great stories. It's great storytelling. You can actually watch a professional doing it. Uh, and there are a few uh, professionals. That, there's a guy in Canada. He's actually, uh, you know, he's from the West. He went to Japan, studied for a few years under a prolific Rakugo instructor, and came back. He does shows. Uh, there's a few Japanese people that have come to the West and done shows in English too. Uh, they're great. Uh, uh, there's multiple ones, and I can't give you any of their names off the top of my head. <laughs> but uh, there's a few you can find on YouTube as well that are pretty good. I highly suggest it, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming.